Talarkan is an architecture and design studio based in New York and Guatemala, founded in 2013 by Ines Guzman and Gregory Militanov after having worked at Renzo Piano Building Workshop. Of course, with embracing the collaborative nature of design itself, what really sets them apart is their playful approach to design with social and cultural relevancy. This means that Teller Ken brings in and translates the different skills and voices of design into whimsical vocabularies, a vibrant color palette, and other creative attributes of playfulness, but still manages to raise conversations and make an impact that are important to address socially and culturally. So how exactly do they do that? And what aspects of play it really is effective in getting these across? is what we are going to chat about today. So I have Greg here with me, and thank you so much for wanting to share. Hi, thanks so much for having us. Perfect. Can you tell us what's the story behind, like how did it all start? Ines is from Guatemala, but grew up in Costa Rica, and I'm a born and raised New Yorker. Ines and I met in 2010 when we were both working for Renzo Piano as you mentioned mm. uh, we both worked for him in his office in Genoa Italy afterwards uh, we started our firm together in 2013 and have been working together ever since before I studied architecture I had a background in fine arts and Ines worked for her family business doing window displays and uh, was working in more of the commercial and fashion world. Uh, that's where the maybe the play comes from. <laughs> <That's it>. Maybe. <laughs> cool. So before we dive deep into the playful design with cultural and social relevance, what do you mean when you say um, social and cultural relevancy so do you is it something that you create from design so it's conversation that sparks based on the designs that you create or do you design because of them so it really depends on the project and what the client is bringing to the table in terms of having an open mind but we feel it's our responsibility to have projects that reflect elements of the context we are working in and so we always try to make a project feel like it belongs to the place it's in by dialoguing with elements that are either socially relevant, such as responding to environmental conditions, maybe, or culturally relevant in terms of responding to local traditions that involve craft or design in some way. Right. So do they usually come from the client, like they want this, or do you like suggest them? I think it really depends per project, but um, usually we have a discussion with the client regarding the kind of work that we've done before. Mm -hmm. And if the client is looking for a design that's more problem solving, like uh, I have a store for glasses, I want to sell glasses, then we really look for ways to make that less predictable because the internet allows you to find every kind of glasses store there is. So how do we take a, a kind of nice design, a, like a well done design as the baseline and then try to push it to be more relevant or more tailored to the place it's um, in. Because then it'll have more impact, right? Yes, yeah, so it's a, it's a feedback loop. So it's impact that benefits the client as well because if their project is able to communicate to more people, um, not just about, let's say, uh, the product that they're trying to sell or their house, but actually um, make a connection with people um, on meaningful issues, then they're going to be, um, they're going to stand out more from the everyday context. Yeah, so 
Yeah, maybe you can tell us a bit about an example of our project. One of the projects that reflects um, both of these approaches really well is the Saul Madero restaurant we did in Guatemala City. The site uh, that the client chose was located on the main highway in and out of Guatemala City uh, because it was a very um, good place to put a to put a restaurant. Uh, because the highway is very trafficked. However, it's also very polluted. And because Guatemala City has experienced an increasing amount of urban sprawl as the economy has grown, the uh, outskirts of the city along that highway are dominated by big box shopping centers and kind of very generic um, architecture. So um, our project uh, on the outside, we wanted to um, reflect that context back on itself. And so we conceived of the project as kind of a large four-sided billboard, uh, which was studded with cars in order to provoke a reaction from passersby. So when you're zooming past on the highway, you see these cars kind of crashed into this cube, or when you're stuck in traffic on the highway, you're kind of like uh, seeing it as a, as a joke. So it's very, it's very eye-catching at these two different scales, but because it's a um, opaque uh, facade for the, for the restaurant, it also blocks out the view of the highway, which is really uh, ugly. So on the inside of the project, then we did the opposite. So the interior of the project is, is almost an, like an oasis from this um, really overbuilt commercial context. So um, mm -hmm. it uses all natural light, all natural ventilation. It claims all the rainwater off of the roof, which feeds these big blue um, tanks in the project. So uh, the project makes a big effort to um, celebrate this kind of um, sustainable approach. Mm -hmm. And so it's almost um, like using a utopian attitude towards sustainability as the driver of the design. And it uses local materials and fabrics um, as the interior finishes. So we're reflecting the reality of the exterior context back on itself through the facade and the cars, but then on the interior showing the natural beauty that exists in the country through a more sustainable way uh, and using local textures and materials um, to highlight the cultural traditions that are very specific to Guatemala. Right, right. So I think the contrast uh, becomes more clear and more effective when you juxtapose it, like the exterior and the interior. Yeah, it, it really, it's kind of a disconnect, but that's what um, really the, the site called for because you have two different types of users. You either have the people that are just zooming by and how do you kind of advertise to them in a way that's not like the typical um, McDonald's sign. And then you have the people that actually do come to the restaurant uh, and you want to create an experience that is not typical of this kind of highway drive through um, place so we really created like a destination on a on a road that's really meant to um, be kind of a, a drive-through. Sounds really cool. <laughs> so having worked across many scales from maybe doing like smaller projects to larger engagements, uh, which ones do you enjoy the most and maybe in being able to tell the story or the tale? So over the years, we've really learned to enjoy working on large-scale public engagement projects because 
many other types of projects are already decided before the architect or designer comes to the table. Similar to the story I just mentioned, that that project was determined that it would be on this very highly trafficked highway. We didn't decide that that was mm -hmm. the location. That's a, uh, a commercial decision. Um, and so uh, not being involved in the whole process is especially true of uh, interior design projects or decoration projects where we're pretty limited in the role that we're asked to do. And generally we see a lot of missed opportunities that took place in the decision-making process before we are, were involved, but it's, it's almost too late at that point. And we're only working with a very small percentage of the project and a small percentage of the budget. The public engagement projects, uh, on the other hand, require a bottom-up design process from the beginning. Mm. In the case of our fundamental design is initiative, which is a um, self-funded, self-initiated program, we are also the client. So we're creating design that appeals to ourselves and also all of the stakeholders that we're able to bring around the table. Uh, so it's really a many hands make light work approach. And being able to be involved in all aspects in the process, yeah. That's right, and also not only to have the designer design or design what they're told to design in the style that the client likes, but actually just begin the conversation from early on with uh, municipalities or um, local communities to really understand what's needed and help to drive the discussion to give people options about design that they might not consider. So it really helps to um, bring outside of the box ideas to the table. Yeah, and on that note, Tarakan is very much associated with play. And yeah, the very first time we came across the studio, we were seeing the, your portfolios. It's a happy projection <laughs> of projects. So. What about playful design intrigued you to want to stick to it throughout the practice? In general, I find that arch architecture and design is something that is not very easily understood by people. Uh, it doesn't resonate very much. And um, people really don't understand what architects do. And so for us, having a playful approach is we, we have a very playful aesthetic. It's just in our personality, both Ines and I have a very playful um, dynamic, mm -hmm. but it is also uh, about increasing the ability for our designs to communicate people. And I think that that uh, has an effect um, about outreaching beyond the specific project uh, as well. So the more people are excited about the design, uh, especially early on, the easier it is to bring people involved in the project to the table and allow them to participate in the process. But also, as we kind of touched on earlier, the more the project just makes people happy or puts a smile on their mm -hmm. face, the, the broader the appeal is. So if there's a building that looks like a big smiley face, for example, everyone will know that building because mm -hmm. everybody wants to get connected somehow. They can use it for photos to, to kind of build um, connection uh, virtually 
for example. And so those projects tend to be a little more iconic uh, because, because they just connect with more people. And that has a benefit, of course, um, to us as designers because our work is recognizable and has a benefit to our clients because especially if it's a commercial project, um, the design represents more than, than maybe just their, their brand. It, it kind of becomes a, a destination or a place that people uh, recognize without necessarily ever having been inside. Right. And maybe it becomes much more inclusive as well because it, playfulness is a universal language that everyone understands and can resonate with. Yes, yeah. that's exactly exactly right. Um, yeah. What, so, what elements of playful that intrigues the audience, maybe in like color or texture, in your experience? Yes. So, I think that, as you said, that the designs tend to be universal because they're bold and simple and use uh, color and pattern and scale. And so these are the things that are, um, as designers, the tools at our disposal that can let people know that, um, that they are welcome in a project, that, that the project mm -hmm. is sort of um, friendly and, and kind of meant for everyone. And especially if those patterns and, and textures and things are local um, to that kind of speak to cultural traditions that that kind of engages with a different uh, group of people. And so I think that that's a way to um, make people have uh, an inclusive attitude towards architecture and design, because I think we're all hardwired to engage in building from the time we're young. Uh, everybody mm -hmm. makes sandcastles or drawing of houses or plays with blocks and those those things all have kind of a an aesthetic to them a look and feel and so the more our design can kind of communicate back to people's memories of of um playing playing as child uh, as children mm -hmm. then i think it helps to get them engaged in the in the work yeah I wonder if there's a research on that, on like how play from like childhood memories support connectiveness with design. <laughs> uh, interestingly, when I um, speak to young architects or designers and, and my, in my classes or whatnot, I now, my first question I ask them is, is what's your first memory of architecture design? Uh, to try to uh, start a conversation about that kind of first memory that really br brings you into studying um, design as a, as a career, because I mm -hmm. find that it all starts when everyone is very young. Yeah, I think so. I mean, from the day one, we built things. We not only we built Sun Castle, we, make things right we make food we make products yeah. we make buildings yeah that's right yeah so lastly since you have an office in guatemala and in new york at the same time i'm curious does location make your approach different and tailored to each market yeah uh so we want to make the projects dialogue with their context as much as possible um i think it's easy to say that only like the bright colorful projects can be made in Latin America. That's a response that I've gotten in New York quite a lot, mm -hmm. uh, which is really, which is really disappointing. Um, and I think some of that attitude is, is changing the more uh, younger people come into the conversation. Um, but uh, it, we're very excited to be working on a large scale public installation right now in downtown Brooklyn, which uses pattern and color and plants that's very characteristic of our style. 
but at the same time is also the design is a play on the typical New York scaffolding, which you don't really find anywhere else in the world. Yeah. So we're trying to maintain some themes in our work, no matter where they are, because it helps us to build a, uh, a kind of recognizable style with our clients. So that means the clients come to us based on our previous work, and therefore they're more open to letting us um, drive the conversation uh, rather than having us do an assignment or, or problem solving. Um, so we do try to maintain some themes in our work, no matter what the project is, but we always want to have the project feel local and familiar to the people um, in, a, in a specific location, but present them that uh, thing that they're, that they're familiar with in a fresh and unexpected way. Uh, thank you for sharing. I think there's a lot of disjunct in this world right now, especially. And it is sort of a reminder that there's always something that can tie us all together in universal language, like play, where everyone can just connect to and think that we're all in this together. <laughs> so thank you so much for sharing. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, it's really exciting that... Um you as a young person are getting out and doing your own thing. Uh, we really encourage and support that. Thank you.